Should I mark the bowings myself in my string parts? Not unless you yourself are an experienced string player. And not even then. To be clear about this from the start, marking bowings means the addition of up bow and down bow marks, not the simple necessity of adding slurs. It's the responsibility of the concertmaster to assign these bowing marks to any work that the orchestra is to perform. They bring the weight of their experience and leadership to the task of sorting out how to mark bowing so that all the members of the string section play with unity or differentiation in contrapuntal passages. But beyond the simple mathematics of making the bow strokes all come out evenly in the end are artistic considerations. Which series of bow strokes will most efficiently realize the expression of a gesture? What are the particular strengths of each section, and how will they affect the energy of the delivery? Part of the definition of leadership entails knowing the capabilities and style of everyone whom you're leading, and how to make the best use of those factors. Since this differs widely from orchestra to orchestra, there really can be no standard edition of marked parts for any work, though certainly the typical orchestra can make do with any decent set of bowings on short notice. Concertmasters frequently take a set of existing marked parts, make a few adjustments, and leave it at that. What does that mean for you? Since your original work or new orchestration is going to be a premiere, then the chief way you can help with the Boeings is to submit your score and parts on time so that the concertmaster has a chance to look them over and mark Boeings. Your services aren't required for marking Boeings and in fact can be a very annoying hindrance. As little time as the librarian may have to copy out all the parts, they have even less time to go through every page of every string part with whiteout, blanking out your directions so the concertmaster can start with a clean slate. There are exceptions, of course. If there's a passage that specifically needs to be bowed a certain way for a musical effect, then you should mark it. Most commonly, this would be a row of down bows for extremely emphatic articulation. A series of up bows may also be used to help set up a particularly devastating down bow with leaping anticipation. Or you might want to indicate what shouldn't be done. You may wish that a passage be played strictly detaché rather than with a bouncing ricochet approach. In that case, mark a couple of up-down bowings and leave it at that. In fact, if there is a particular bowing approach that you want string players to take, it's best to mark its first and maybe second instance, and then trust them to get it right for the rest of the time. This is similar to the approach you should take with articulations, which I'll cover in a future tip. For now, though, learn to trust your concertmaster and leave it up to them to mark bowings in nearly every case. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, off camera for the next few videos while my house is under renovation. This video was released in conjunction with the start of Term 1 of the Massive Open Online Orchestration course. The first assignment is to score a work for unaccompanied violin. Obviously, this is going to bring up the issue of bowing marks, and as I just explained, these are really for the players to decide and not the composer. However, that doesn't mean the composer shouldn't think about bowing at all. Far from it. You should work out the slurs in every bar so that players have a good scheme for working out their own bowing. There are really three issues at stake here. The natural up and down motion of the bow, the strength of the bow stroke depending on its position, and the expressive arc of the overall phrase. Let's take a quick look at each of these now, and then you can get back to your work. First, let's go back to Bach, whom I praised in Lesson 1 of the MOOC for his clear and logical bowing schemes. In the assigned score reading for that lesson, the third partita has some great examples of this. For instance, in the second bar of the opening prelude, Bach assigns a slur over a group of sixteenth notes plus the next eighth note. We tend to think of beam groups as single expressive units, so why slur an extra note? In this case, it's so that the next note can be played up bow, and the furious detaché momentum of the bowing can be preserved. Bach uses a similar approach in many other places, like the beginning of the Gigue, where this time the grouped beams are slurred one note short to change bow directions, so that a firm down bow may be applied to the beginning of the next group. This is just one example of thinking ahead on the part of a composer. You don't have to follow this example, but consider the practical consequences of bowing motion as you apply your own slurs. The second concern is one of emphasis. As I covered in Orchestration 101, the string section, 
the bow starts strong and loses energy in a down bow, and the reverse in an up bow. Players correct this natural tendency in sustained notes, but for the smoothest bowing, it's best to work with these variations of energy rather than against them. This normally means that a downbeat gets a down bow, and an upbeat an up bow. But not always. Sometimes on a crescendo note, the concertmaster will tweak the bowing so that the downbeat is an up bow. Or sometimes the entire phrase must be planned ahead just so that the last note can end on a down bow. Back to Bach's third partita again. The Gavotte's bowing scheme implies that the final note of the first phrase should end in a long up bow. But no violinist wants to do this. Watch a few performances on YouTube and see how each player solves this problem. Guidon Kramer simply starts with an up bow so that he can end on a down bow. Gil Shaham, on the other hand, starts with a down bow, but then throws in two up bows in a row just before the final long down bow. Bach could have solved all these problems simply by marking a slur on the second beat of the first complete bar, but he chooses not to, and so violinists have had to adjust to the consequences for the rest of history. The final concern is simply how the natural tendencies of bowing can support an expressive idea. This goes beyond up or down, crescendo versus decrescendo, and so on. It's more to do with the quality of melisma, how many notes should be connected in one smooth bow stroke. This is something that can really only be answered by your own sense of lyricism. Just don't overestimate the length of the bow. The longer the slur, the slower and therefore softer the bow stroke must be. On the other hand, avoid slurring into a downbeat or in any other way robbing the meter of a bar of its rhythmic emphasis in your scheme. If someone in a string section raises their hand and asks the question, who's got the downbeat in bar 17? Then you may well need to work on your phrasing a bit more. These orchestration questions will return soon with more topics that relate to the ongoing Term 1 MOOC. See you soon.